Hello everyone! Today is an exciting day because after wanting to for a few years, I'm finally getting to review Latitude Zero. Latitude Zero is a Japanese-American co-production released by Toho in 1969, directed by Ishiro Honda and starring Joseph Cotton, Cesar Romero, Akira Takarada, and Richard Jekyll. This sci-fi fantasy adventure begins when a Japanese research vessel drops a shuttle carrying two scientists and a reporter into the ocean. A sudden eruption sends the shuttle tumbling into the depths, but though its occupants should probably be dead after getting jostled around so much, two mysterious Serious divers come to the rescue and bring their whole craft aboard a sleek submersible that eventually conveys them to a technologically advanced underwater utopia known as Latitude Zero. I got this two-disc DVD set for Christmas. One DVD has the Japanese version, which runs 89 minutes, and the other disc has the American version, which runs 105 minutes. I was super excited to have the opportunity to watch both versions, but there was some confusion. The DVD says original Japanese version, and my default would be to watch the original first. But in this case, I hesitated because <laughs> Joseph Cotton is one of my favorite actors, and I'd rather hear him speak his own lines. So, I wasn't sure what to do, we had some nail-biting moments while I was trying to decide, and I almost fell back on a coin toss, but at the last minute, professionalism won out, and I popped the Japanese version in the player. Well, after some logos and graphics that looked awfully late 90s, the movie started playing, and uh-oh, there were no translations for the main titles. That's not a great sign. I went back to the menu, looking for audio options, didn't find any, decided to push a little further and see if subtitles came on once somebody started talking, and they didn't. So never mind! I guess we're gonna watch the American version first after all! There are two things I was wrong about here. Number one, the American version is the original version of this film. Latitude Zero is unique in that it was filmed in English. The Japanese version is the dub that was released for Japanese audiences. So I'm not sure if this is really my mistake or the distributor's mistake for labeling the DVD as original Japanese version. I'm not sure what they meant by that. Number two, last night I started playing the Japanese version on my laptop and it did have subtitles. I don't get it. Latitude Zero gets off to a slow start as Joseph Cotton reads an overly technical exposition dump from the script. But once things get going, whoa! <laughs> this is probably one of the campiest movies I've reviewed so far, certainly the campiest thing I've seen from this director. Behind the scenes of this tokusatsu film, we've got the usual suspects, Ashiro Honda directing, Tomoyuki Tanaka producing, Eiji Tsuburaya doing the special effects, Akira Fukube doing the music score, and in front of the camera, we've got quite the cast, and that was the biggest draw for me. Joseph Cotton and Akira Takarada starring together in a wacky Japanese movie? I've gotta see it. There's definitely a Jules Verne bent to this science fiction tale, which also takes a page from H.G. Wells' Island of Dr. Moreau. The first part has our unwitting exploratory trio encountering a high-tech submersible called the Alpha that was launched in 1805, manned by a crew that's at least that old, but doesn't look it. The style of the film seems pretty tame in the beginning. It's when the guys meet the Alpha's medical doctor, a lady wearing a gold backless bikini dress thing and go-go boots, that you get your first hint that this is going to be a little wild. And then they meet Joseph Cotton's Captain Mackenzie, who's dressed halfway between a pimp and a pirate. I don't think I ever wondered what he would look like dressed as a swashbuckler, but now I know! Like I said, Joseph Cotton is a favorite actor of mine going way back. I love him in The Third Man, Shadow of a Doubt, Since You Went Away, Gaslight, and so on. Compared to highly regarded titles like Citizen Kane, The Third Man, and Shadow of a Doubt, Latitude Zero seems really out there for him. But just a couple years later, he would play the straight man to Vincent Price's eccentric serial killer in the horror comedy The Abominable Dr. Fives. And a couple years after that, he would play a supporting role in Soylent Green. So something like this wasn't so out of the ordinary. 
Some people will snarkily say, gee, his career must have really gone downhill. He must have been desperate for a paycheck. And yes, he was an actor who was getting older, who wanted to keep on working. But from the Japanese perspective, getting Joseph Cotton to star in their movie was exciting. He was a bona fide famous movie star and a big catch. I can't help grinning whenever I see him in these outfits. I can just imagine him taking a look at these costumes and saying, you want me to wear that? But flamboyant tops and ascots aside, he gives a low-key, charming performance. His Captain Mackenzie is down to earth, but also a pleasant man. I bet Cotton was a good sport on set, and the script includes lots of humorous quips, which he delivers with light amusement. He also looks really good for someone who's supposed to be 204 years old. Cesar Romero plays Mackenzie's nemesis, Malik, an evil genius who wants to defeat the Alpha and take over the world, of course. Going into this, I somehow forgot who Cesar Romero was. I was thinking he was famous for being on game shows in the 60s and 70s, like Hollywood Squares or something. <laughs> I completely overlooked the fact that he was the first to play the Joker on the 60s Batman TV show with Adam West. I also have seen him in a few older movies, so I don't know what happened there. <laughs> Maybe I got him confused with someone else? If you're familiar with his Joker, then you probably have a fair idea how he plays this character. Malik is a ham through and through, mere seconds away from twirling his mustache in true dastardly cartoon villain fashion. You're a monster. No, I'm a genius. He's assisted by two henchwomen, one his girlfriend Lucretia, played by Patricia Medina. In real life, Medina was married to Joseph Cotton, so this is interesting. They only share a little bit of screen time. It's a very quick scene where she tries to stab him with a loaded syringe. <laughs> That's nice, isn't it? <laughs> In this film, Medina reminded me of Joan Collins. Maybe it's the makeup and big earrings. Maybe it's the glamorous feathers, animal prints, and scoopy necklines. Maybe it's how much she relishes being bad. Lucretia and Malik eagerly watch the prolonged sea chase that unfolds between the Alpha and the Black Shark, which is Malik's ship under the control of Captain Kuroiga. She is played by Hikaru Kuroki in what seems to be her only film appearance. As she whips her long ponytail all over the place, Kuroiga seems every bit as unhinged as Malik and Lucretia, and she looks forward to taking Lucretia's place someday. Really, there's not a single, subtle, underplayed moment between the three of them. Back to the good guys, our viewpoint characters are played by Akira Takarada, Richard Jekyll, and Masumi Okada. Takarada's Japanese physicist and oceanographer leads the team, joined by Okada's French geologist and Jekyll's American reporter. Akira Takarada quickly became one of my favorites when I went through the Godzilla movies a few years ago. He appeared in half a dozen of them, he's always good, he gives a particularly enjoyable performance in Mothra vs. Godzilla. He also starred opposite Nick Adams in 65's Invasion of Astro Monster, and opposite Linda Miller in Rhodes Reason in 67's King Kong Escapes. So acting alongside Americans wasn't a new thing for him. But in those films, if I remember correctly, half the cast is dubbed. Which half, depending on which version you're watching. If you're watching the Japanese version, the American actors are dubbed. If you're watching the American version, the Japanese actors are dubbed, all to make one audio track. I kind of assumed they would do the same thing here just because that's how all the other movies have been, but I was in for a big surprise. Here we go. Is he not dubbed? This is Control. How do you read us? Loud and clear. Just passing 20 fathoms. I couldn't believe it! He's speaking English, he's speaking his own lines. It's amazing! This is what I've always wanted them to do! I learned from the interviews in the special features that they intentionally cast Japanese actors who could speak English and be understood by American audiences. And they specifically sought individuals who would make sense in each part. 
I must say, this aspect of it made the movie so much better for me. How many times have you had to listen to me complain about dubbing and about people in scenes not all speaking the same language and about how I just hate when someone is speaking and you know that that is not how they really sound and the dubbing actors just have this sing-songy quality that kind of grates on my ears and I've always wanted something like this and finally we have a movie where they do it yes <laughs> Richard Jekyll plays a skeptical reporter looking for answers, documenting everything with his camera. He's a good-natured guy, but also suspicious, especially when it seems like there's too much of a good thing. He's also kind of a sexist. His captain is Gregor, a woman. Mm. Like Cotton, Jekyll had been acting for decades, mostly as a character actor in military films and westerns. I've seen him in a ton of stuff. To sci-fi and cult movie fans, he's probably most known for being in The Green Slime, another Japanese co-production he co-starred in the year before Latitude Zero. But believe it or not, these two films are outliers in his prolific career, and shortly after this, he was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor in 1971's Sometimes a Great Notion. French geologist Jules Masson is played by Japanese actor Masumi Okada, who was half Japanese, half Danish, and was actually born in France. He was fluent in Japanese, English, and French, so not only does he speak English very clearly, he also can do it with a hint of a French accent. It's very interesting. Other members of the cast include the aforementioned Doctor, played by Linda Haynes, who made this movie on her way to bigger American projects. The character is kind of bland, but she does what she can with some cumbersome lines, and she does it while wearing some ridiculously skimpy outfits. Even her lab coat is clear. I figured it was designed that way so she'd still look half-naked, but then Akihiko Hirata wears one too. Yes, another Godzilla series favorite, Akihiko Hirata, is in this movie as well. His English isn't as clear as some others. I confess I couldn't understand half of what he said, and perhaps that's why he appears in only one brief scene. I was thrilled to see and hear him, though. And the kidnapped Dr. Okada is played by Tetsu Nakamura, who was also fluent in English and who looked familiar to me because he's appeared in a number of films I've seen and reviewed, Mothra, Space Amoeba, The Manster, The Mysterians, The H-Man, which I haven't actually reviewed yet, someday soon. I also recognized this girl, but I couldn't figure out why until I looked her up. It's Kathy Haran, and she was in a bunch of Japanese movies, including The X from Outer Space, King Kong Escapes, the Green Slime, Goke Body Snatcher from Hell. The one I remember her in, because she had a major role and I saw it recently, was Genocide. She appears in one scene here where she speaks two or three lines and that's it. But it drove me crazy trying to place her. So if anyone else watches the movie and suffers from the same affliction, there you go, there's an explanation. The first half of the movie introduces the utopia that is Latitude Zero, an advanced culture made up of scientists, doctors, mathematicians, etc. from all over the world. Some retain their native dress, while others walk around in gold bathing suits because why not? There are different styles of architecture and means of transportation, and no discord anywhere. Takarada thinks it's great. Jekyll, of course, doesn't believe it. They could have brought them down here and then brainwash them into working for me. Oh, you're out of your head. I was briefly reminded of 1973's Godzilla vs. Megalon. That's the one with the underwater toga people from Seatopia who send Megalon up to the surface to wreck stuff. That movie was made by Jun Fukuda, not Ishiro Honda. I should also mention that there's some overlap between Latitude Zero and the British film Captain Nemo and the Underwater City, which also came out in 1969. I haven't seen that movie, so I can't comment on it, but here's the first line of the Wikipedia summary. Captain Nemo's submarine Nautilus rescues drowning passengers and takes them to an underwater city. <laughs> sounds awfully close to this. After that, it sounds like it goes in a very different direction, but the initial similarity is uncanny. 
The second half of this film is concerned with a scientist, Dr. Okada, who's invented an anti-radiation serum which Malik wants to get his hands on. So he kidnaps Dr. Okada and his daughter as they're en route to Latitude Zero. This sends our heroes off on a rescue mission. I had assumed this movie would have monsters in it, because they usually do, but having come this far without a creature in sight, I figured I was mistaken. And then this happened. Whoa, what are those? Malik has these things, and they're freaky. Like a cross between a bat and a bear with a wolf's face. But wait, there's more! Yeah, the creatures in this are very low budget, the costumes are rough, they're clearly just guys standing there flapping their arms or crawling on their hands and knees. It's laughable. If you're inclined to be harshly critical of the costumes and the effects, I will explain that Toho was left in the lurch on this movie. Shortly after filming started, the American production company that was helping finance the whole thing bailed. I believe they filed for bankruptcy. So Shiro Honda had to choose between canceling the whole thing or moving forward on a severely reduced budget. Obviously, he chose to make the movie anyway, retaining the American stars who cost quite a lot of money. And that meant there wasn't as much left for anything else. Considering that nightmare, I think they did a pretty good job. Malik's malevolence reaches new heights when we find out he's something of a mad scientist. One of his more sinister plans involves the making of a griffin-like creature, with the body of a lion, the wings of a condor, and a human brain which will do his bidding. Oh no, it's a brain transplant movie! You know how I feel about brain transplants! Ignoring the fact that the thing looks derpy as all get out, although it's Godzilla suit actor Haruo Nakajima in there doing the best he can, there's actually some grody, disturbing stuff here. When Malik starts sawing into that lion's head to extract its brain, there's no blood, it's just sound effects, but it's pretty gross. The second half throws all kinds of things at the viewer. There's some obligatory 60s innuendo with the Bath of Immunity scene. Allegedly, the American producers wanted full nudity in this scene, but Honda put his foot down and shot it tastefully. Thank you. And then they get new outfits, which are no less flashy, though a little less fleshy. I'd say the blood rock portion of the film is where things go bonkers. We've got Malik and his beastly creations, a deadly sulfurous pit, and also rodents of unusual size! The bad things are used like guards, which act a lot like the flying monkeys in The Wizard of Oz, and then they take flight, which seals the deal. The big confrontation has some tense fighting and lots of visible wires and a bad attack where the size of the critters is wildly inconsistent. There's a clumsy kill and a body turns to dust for some reason, a la 1958's Horror of Dracula. There's a lot going on. And it doesn't end there, but unfortunately, the final battle is kind of boring. It's just too slow and goes on for too long, and then it's still not over. There's a twist ending that is kind of fun, but also a little confusing. And I don't necessarily like it when a movie reaches its conclusion and I'm left scratching my head and saying, huh? The fact that the movie drags in a few spots reminds me that the American version is 15 minutes longer than the Japanese one. So now I've got to ask, why is it so much shorter? What are the differences? I watched the film yet again, but this time the Japanese version with English subtitles. Yes, the subtitles do work on the DVD. I don't know why they didn't play before. As far as length goes, it's not that there's a lot of material taken out. The only sizable omission I detected was the removal of everything related to the high-tech dinner, how to order the food, and Takarada and Jekyll sitting down to eat it. 
Otherwise, what's missing are little things, like Kroiga cursing at Malik and the more awkward effects shot using the elevation belts. The main thing is that many of the shots are just a little bit shorter. Seconds are shaved off here and there, which tightens up the pace so that the dramatic scenes move slightly faster. So even though it's 15 minutes shorter, the film is still pretty much the same, with no major changes. The audio, though, does make a big difference. It was fun to compare the Japanese actors' line readings. I think Takarada's and Hirata's voices sound softer when they're speaking English. Maybe it's because Japanese is a little more throaty, with more force behind some of the words. Or maybe it has to do with the level of confidence they felt speaking in their native tongue. Or maybe it's just my American ears. This is a great time to illustrate what I've always been saying about how, with dubs done by other voice actors, you lose the original actor's unique tone and inflection. Take this exchange, for example. Well, this Dr. Barton's kind of young, isn't she? She doesn't look much like a doctor. Well, Mr. Lawton, uh, what's a doctor supposed to look like? Ooh. Now, there, there, there. What is that? I don't detect anything special in the way the dubbing actor said Mackenzie's line, but when Cotton said it, there was a knowing and amused retort in there that made the dialogue more interesting. Maybe it's in the Japanese too, but I'm not able to hear it. In general, Captain Mackenzie comes across to me a little differently, as do several other characters. Captain Kroiga sounds less deranged, Lucretia sounds older than Medina looks, the actress dubbing Dr. Barton has a higher, more cutesy voice, which sounds nothing like Linda Haynes' notably sedate tone, and the actor dubbing Jekyll sounds so skeptical he's almost hostile. You see what I mean? The verbal part of the performance has a great deal to do with how I respond to and interpret the character. While this DVD set has its oddities, it does include a couple neat special features. There is a deleted scene pack with some special effects b-roll that includes some city destruction sequences. I've no clue where in the film those were intended to be. There's also a making of featurette where a few Japanese crew members talk about casting, disagreements between the Hollywood style of filmmaking and the Japanese style, and adjustments and compromises that had to be made to suit cultural customs. It's very interesting. Editing Weaselberry here, I pulled Joseph Cotton's autobiography off my shelf to reread what he had to say about the making of Latitude Zero, and he was quite candid about what turned out to be a stressful experience. The American company filing for bankruptcy mid-production was a huge problem, an awkward and alarming situation for both the as-yet-unpaid American actors and the Japanese filmmakers already at the limit of their budget. Then, at the tail end of the shoot, Medina, who had wrapped her part, caught the flu. Cotton worried about leaving her alone at the hotel every day as she recovered, and when he caught it himself, the set interpreter dismissed his illness and insisted he come in to finish his scenes when he was so unwell he could barely stand. Other than that, though, it sounds like he and his wife had a pleasant time and enjoyed the people. He writes with exceptional wit, and while he says less about the actual filming, it's intriguing to hear his side of the story. To wrap up this review, I really enjoyed Latitude Zero. Yes, it has its flaws, but even when things don't look as good as they were intended to, they're still very entertaining. Considering that they had a shrunken budget, I think they did fairly well with the miniatures and the mats. It's just some of the other stuff that's unfortunate. But the cast is great. I loved seeing Joseph Cotton have fun, I loved experiencing the rarity of Takarada and company speaking English, and the casting of the good guys worked out because they gel quite nicely. There's a naturalness to their interactions that works in the film's favor. They're likable actors playing likable characters and, apparently, getting on very well with each other. 
And then there are the villains, chewing up the scenery and having a grand old time. I thoroughly enjoyed this movie, and I hope you enjoyed this review. If you've seen Latitude Zero, I would love to hear your take on it, so please feel free to share your thoughts in the comments below, and I'll be back next time. Thanks for watching.